Once again, good morning to everybody. And I will ask again that we bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as Brad already mentioned, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be with Joy and I as we bring this message. But more importantly, I ask that you would send your Spirit to give everyone here the gift of hearing, that they will hear what you would have them hear today. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remember this? Oh, a few weeks ago, actually a couple months ago now, we talked about how the kingdom of God is being attacked one family at a time, that we were experiencing a major heart attack. Then we looked at two foundations of love on this earth, a system we called a Cupid system, or the world system, based on physical attraction, desire, and pleasure, immediate feelings and emotions, open relationships, sometimes called free love. It's all about me, and God is left out of the picture. And as a result, there is the field of casualties that you saw in the previous slide. And we spent quite a bit of time defining the biblical plan, keeping Christ at the center of the marriage as both the builder and the foundation, spiritually uniting for his service with true everlasting commitment to each other through his power, choosing love as a constant principle always placing our spouse first, then, and only then, physical attraction, desire, and pleasure are a gift from God in its rightful place. And if we will rely on God's power to commit to his plan for marriage, we can count on him to bless our marriage and our family. But... Did you know that placing your marriage on a firm foundation based on these principles is not enough. Your home is your castle, right? Well, doesn't every new bride dream of being queen of that castle? Though it sounds kind of romantic right now, fancy ballrooms, you know, pretty dresses. Sir Galahad knocking at the door. Isn't that what you dream of? What is another term for a castle. It's a fort. A fortress, a large fortified building or complex of buildings, usually with tall, solid walls, battlements. You see, every husband and wife must consider themselves king and queen of their fort and must take responsibility to see that the fort is fortified, is secure at all times. Thus our topic for today. Fort Pulaski was built in the 1930s. A 19, excuse me, 1830s and 1840s. Yeah, it predates all, everyone here. At the mouth of the Savannah River. Okay, if you look here, you got the Savannah River, and there's this island right at the entrance, and right there is Fort. <laughs> Pulaski. It was there to guard the entrance to the city of Savannah. It took many years, there we go, to build. It has a double moat system of entry. The walls were 11 feet thick of brick masonry. And if you look here, okay, you've got the main fort. You have a moat that surrounds the fort itself, but then to get there, you have to cross another moat to get there. It had cannons atop the wall. Fort Pulaski was virtually impregnable. In 1862, the fort was in the hands of the Confederate forces. One day, it was observed that an that island across the channel, 
the Union forces were setting up camp, even setting up canyon, cannons. And if we look right, okay, here's the fort, and right over in here was where the Union forces were setting up their cannons. But this was a, considered of no concern. You see, it was approximately three miles across the river to the island, but a cannon could only fire a cannonball approximately a quarter of a mile. Absolutely no reason to worry. Clearly, Fort Pulaski was safe from the enemy. But on April 10, 1862, the Union forces began firing on Fort Pulaski. But something was different this time, as the walls of the fort were peppered with cannon fire. The bombardment lasted for 30 hours. The wall was breached, exposing the fort's main magazine, which, if hit, would blow up the fort and all within the walls. On April 11, Colonel Olmsted surrendered the fort. So what went wrong? Unknown to Colonel Olmsted, the Union forces had a new secret weapon. It was called the rifling cannon. Whereas in the past, a cannon could only fire a cannonball approximately a quarter of a mile, the new rifling cannon could now fire a projectile four to five miles accurately. And that lesson echoes down the down through history to us today, we must never consider ourselves out of the range of the enemy while we're on this earth. Hold the fort. You see, if we do not guard the fort, the marriage, the family, even if it was founded on the biblical principles, without constant village, vigilance, it is in danger of crumbling. Some fall due to external attacks, but unfortunately many just simply collapse from within. Everywhere you turn, the home is under attack. Some of the attacks are blatant, others are subtle. The TV programs, the internet, the radio, the smartphone, the magazines, video games, the ads on TV, the ads on the mail, in the mailbox, the billboards by the highways, the aisles in the stores, just to name a few. A while back, Alfonso made a presentation and he said that some, th and it set me thinking. You see, Alfonso brought up the fact that at some point a coworker had criticized he and Leslie for keeping the family too sheltered. That someday when the kids were exposed to worldly influences, they wouldn't know how to handle it and would just immediately cave to the influences. Let's refer to this as inoculation theory. What is inoculation theory? Well, you know, in the biological world, we have vaccines. And by introducing small amounts of dead bacteria or whatever. Other nasty things. Other nasty things. We can build up immunity in our bodies. But not everything in the physical world has a spiritual correlation. Even the physical world inoculation therapy doesn't always work. For instance, let's look at the world of law enforcement. We know our officers are going to be sent into harm's way. Let's give them some inoculations. Let's start out with BBs and get them toughened up. Then let's progress to pellet guns, then to 22s. Then how about a 357? Certainly we can work them up so that they can tolerate a bazooka if we just try hard enough. Of course, that's all ridiculous. Yet how often do we try that in the spiritual realm? Folks, we must guard the avenues of our marriages and our homes. A few years back, it gets further and further back, actually. <clears throat> this predates the Internet. 
there was a huge outcry among evangelicals that our homes were being invaded by violence and sex on TV. In reality, that was absolutely absurd. Let me clarify. If trash is on our TV, if it's on your TV, or on other media in our homes, it's not an invader. It's there as an invited guest. And we each have the power to stop the enemy at the door. You know, there is an off switch. Or you can actually remove objects from your house. Do not allow the enemy to place footprints in your fort. We're going to call this principle guard the entries. In the last presentation, we discussed commitment. That means marriage is for keeps. As one person put it on the questionnaire, remove the option of divorce. If you pay any attention to Hollywood, it is clear that to most, marriage and divorce is just the title of one big game. That is, if they bother to play the game. But Christ's view is entirely different. You see in Matthew 19, 5 and 6, and he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. There's a big trend today, especially in wealthier classes, to draw up what is called a prenuptial agreement. That's a big fancy name for, let's decide ahead of time what's going to happen to all this stuff in the case we decide to call it quits. It's, we'll give it a try and see if it works. Unfortunately, prenuptial agreements often become what we call self-fulfilling prophecies. Now, having said all of that, Joy and I started with a nuptial agreement. Did you bring it with you? Uh, no, but I can sure quote it. <laughs> Till death do us part, and you better not be going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> no intent. And we feel that God has blessed that agreement. You see, we entered into marriage with one-way tickets. We didn't come with return tickets in our back pockets, just in case. You know, a number of years ago, my parents would get together on Saturday night with other young couples, and they would play games. They'd get pretty wild. You know how the game Scrabble can go. <laughs> Periodically, some would make a statement like, if you make that play, I'll just divorce you. Or at the table, boy, <clears throat> this loaf is grounds for divorce. Years later, my folks observed that almost every one of those couples who had talked that way had later divorced. Though difficulties and perplexities and discouragements may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment, determined to be all that it is possible to be to each other. That's from Adventist Home. So let's make, let's add, make no provision for divorce. Divorce is no joking matter. Some of you may recall several years back, there was a Secrets of, Mar of Marriage questionnaire that we handed out here. One of the responses was absolute, complete compliance to wedding vows. Unfortunately, all too often, this principle is violated. And when it is, it's what hits the gossip headlines. I can't believe it. They were married 27 years. But often there are warning signs that the, that the individuals ignore. So does that mean I should spy, looking for signs of danger? 
something that my spouse might be doing? What it really means is that I should be looking for the warning signs in myself. Many of you here receive a monthly paper, maybe it's weekly, I don't know, called Value News. A while back, there was an article by Melanie Hasty Grant, a financial counselor, yet she is writing about marriage in infidelity issues. Oops. There we go. She brings up another issue she refers to as emotional infidelity. Emotional infidelity is defined when one partner goes outside the primary relationship to get his or her emotional needs met. If you're talking about problems that are happening in your marriage or with your spouse with someone else of the opposite sex, if you find yourself taking extra time getting ready in the morning to impress a certain coworker, if you're texting excessively with someone who isn't your spouse, if you're hiding emails from your spouse, you may already be having an emotional affair. This is oh so dangerous, yet I have been a first-hand witness to it in the workplace all too often. In Cubicle City, some things are hard to miss. Things aren't going well at home, so they find a sympathizing ear with a coworker of the opposite gender and very soon are spilling their guts about their intimate family issues and grievances. How many of you have seen this in your workplace before? Amen. Okay. It's, so I'm not just speaking of what I've seen. One of two things all too often results. One, the sympathizing ear only reinforces the grievances helping to justify a breakup. Or two, there is an office soap opera and two families are torn to shreds. If you find yourself a participant either as the grieved party or as a self-appointed counselor, beware. You are on very, very dangerous ground. That is not to preclude the proper place for counseling by a professional Christian counselor or pastor, but be sure that any counselor you seek out firmly believes in the biblical pr principle that marriage is for keeps and would be committed to helping you hold the marriage together. But the value news is not presenting a new principle. There is a sacred circle around every family which should be preserved. No other one has any right in that sacred circle. The husband and wife should be all to each other. The wife should have no secrets to keep from her husband and let others know. And the husband should have no secrets to keep from his wife and relate to others. The heart of his wife should be the grave for the faults of the husband and the heart of the husband the grave for his wife's faults. And I'm one that's very thankful for that. Incidentally, the same should be true for the faults of the children. Never should either party indulge in a joke at the expense of the other's feelings. Never should either the husband or wife in sport or in any other manner complain of each other to others. For frequently indulging in this foolish and what may seem perfectly harmless joking will end in trial with each other and perhaps estrangement. I have been shown that there should be a sacred shield around every family. The home circle should be regarded as a sacred place, a symbol of heaven, a mirror in which to reflect ourselves, friends and acquaintances we may have, but in the home they are not to meddle. A strong sense of proprietorship should be felt, giving a sense of ease and restfulness and trust. And proprietorship, what is that? That's a long word. Mm -hmm. It's more than two syllables. Um, proprietorship means a strong sense of ownership. This is my territory. You find that a lot in the business world. So we will add absolute fidelity and 
the sanctity or sacredness of the family circle. But this also brings up another principle. It was right in the middle of the quote. Never should either party indulge in a joke at the expense of the other's feelings. Never should either husband or wife sport in sport or in any other manner complain of each other to others or frequent, for frequently indulging in this foolish and what may seem perfectly harmless joking will end in trial with each other and perhaps estrangement. Never make any demeaning or hurtful statements about your spouse or jokes that put them down. You've heard it. I was just joking. No. A lot of truth is said in jest, unfortunately. We should all aim to uplift our spouses. And yes, guys, that means put them on a pedestal. Make her the queen of the castle. Treat her like a queen, and she will be one. And likewise for the husband. So we add, uplift each other. Never put the other down. There we go. Whoops. Back up one. Back up one. What is this? It's a yoke. What's it used for? Plowing. For pulling a load. A yoke is for two beasts of burden. Put their head, they put their heads into the yoke to pull together to pull a load. It's a beautiful picture of a marriage. The Bible tells what? us... What? A yoke is a pic- good picture of marriage? Yes. Okay. The Bible tells us to do not be unequally yoked. That's in 2 Corinthians 6.14. It means a symbol of cooperation and submission. Now, do we normally want to submit, any of us? That's not human nature, is it? But for a marriage to work, it takes pulling together. Sometimes somebody's not in the yoke, and they're usually in the wagon behind being pulled. (laughs) They're part of the load. And for a while, sometimes when someone is ill, the other partner has to pull by themselves for a while. But hopefully that's not on forever and ever, right? What does that look like besides illness? Sometimes a wife will just be submissive and she'll say, oh, I don't care, you make the decision. Mm, If it's a team... Do we both have input in that decision? Yes, we should have. And sometimes you'll see someone that's always out in front of the team, leading the way, telling everybody else what to do, instead of being in the yoke. And some think, well, that's just a strong person. They're self-reliant, but they're controlling their family Maybe with fear, fear of what will happen if they don't cooperate. Um, Fear is not a good thing. In a family, you don't want fear, do you? You know, there's a story about horses. There was a competition, and these are draft horses, and they're pulling big loads. And the winning horse pulled... 4,500 pounds by itself. The runner-up only pulled 4,000 pounds. And someone got the idea, let's put them, team them up, put them in a yoke. And guess how much the two horses together could pull? How about 12,000 pounds? What either one of them pulled by themselves was not near what the two could do together. And that's the way a marriage is. Teamwork is so important to a marriage. It's not your mess. It's not your broken toilet. 
It's not your dirty dishes. Or your dirty clothes. It's not your child. It's not your bills. Marriage is a union of two that are now one. It becomes our mess. Our broken toilet. And who wants to work on that? But together, we can get the job done, and a whole lot faster. And it's also, dirty work is more fun if there's two of you involved. I will say, there is no such thing as a small chore when it comes to the toilet. Whether it's cleaning or whatever. Okay. Okay, it's our dirty dish, our dirty clothes. Everyone needs to know how to use the washer and dryer or clothesline. And there's no rule that if you used it, you have to wash it. But, but Yeah, well, how many of you in school were taught, you make a mess, you clean it up, right? And you're saying that's not the case in marriage, that I should always let you clean it up. That's true. What, that's true? That I should always let you clean it up? Well, no, you can help me clean it up. Okay, the point is we, you clean it up. Okay. we take responsibility for our actions, but that doesn't mean we have a dividing line in the sand that says, if there's a problem, I, don't, I jump in as well. Both can wash dishes or fill the dishwasher. Both can clean the bathroom. Both can vacuum. Both can work on the car. Now, I don't know much about cars, but I'm a good gopher. I can go get those tools. I can get a bolt. I can get my hand in where he can't. Sometimes I drop things. And I've come out in the middle of the night to find them. <laughs> Maybe it's holding the light so he can see. Maybe it's running to AutoZone to pick up the parts. Because it's our car. When you have a team effort on whatever front, things don't look so insurmountable. The children are our children. Mom and Dad have to sing the same song and verse. Never let the kids play the ends against the middle. If Mom said no, then Dad backs her. They may discuss it later out of earshot. But never in front of the kids. Now you can talk to... Kathleen and Edwin about what happened if we found out they were working the system. Include the children in household jobs or yard work or laundry or dishes. It helps them to grow up to be well-rounded and able to care for themselves. But when they are part of the team too, it makes things easier. That does not mean they are the major decision makers, but they learn to pull together with dad and mom on projects around the house, and we touched on that a little bit in the Sabbath school, about who makes the rules. Or they may help at the church. So we add, we are a team. On the questionnaire over and over, the questionnaire that was back some time ago, over and over again, people said, communication is the secret to a successful marriage. Well, fortunately, we don't have that problem anymore. I mean, after all, who reads the newspaper anymore, right? We would never do that at our house. Or do we have that problem? Let us make some practical suggestions. Make the supper table an electronics. That means cell phones, texting, surfing. And I will say, and reading free zone. I've been at tables before where everyone's sitting around the table. Okay, this is pretty modern here. But everyone had their own book Please pass the potatoes. Huh? 
and back to their book, okay? Meal time needs to be family fun time. Parents, this is when you learn what's going on with your kids, how their day went, what's important to them. You know, some of our family's best memories were from the supper table. We've overhauled engines at the supper table. We have learned what makes an airplane fly and how you control it at the supper table. We play word games with our conversations, increasing vocabularies. Don't waste this precious time. Also, kind of a side note, don't make the supper table the time for discipline. You know, Johnny, I saw earlier today that you were whatever. Supper table is for family time. There are times for discipline, don't get me wrong. So often we set our best face towards Rome. Why is it so easy to be Prince Charming to the outside world, but slobs and rude to those at home? Let's set our best face towards home, to those who mean the most to you, not Rome. Unless you plan on eating it, please don't bring your mobile phone to our dinner table. And that's been a rule at our house for a long time. Love the ones you're with. The people you're with are always more important than the person on the phone. Except, of course, there are emergencies. But with call waiting, you usually know who's calling. Who's calling? Come on. What do I got? A dead battery? There we go. So we add communication and putting our best face towards home, not Rome. You know, how often have you heard a young couple, maybe they're not just necessarily young, say, we have the same interests. We like the same music. We like the same food. We like the same movies. We were just made for each other. You know, honey, do I have news for you? Are you a roller? Or are you a middle squeezer? Do you like Colgate and your spouse like Crest? Do you have the toilet paper come off this way or that way? All those things that you thought you liked so much when you were dating, you'll likely find out that there are many more differences than you ever dreamed. Difference, differences doesn't have to mean difficult, though. Many homes have disintegrated by the tap, tap, tap of unresolved irritations. And it does get to you after a while, doesn't it? Chinese water torture? Mm -hmm. If you can't settle the battle of the toothpaste or how to hang the toilet paper, how are you going to solve the battles of major war zones for some like in-laws, child rearing, or money to name a few? There's a Bible text that I like to quote that has to do with some of those minor irritations. Now, I'm not talking about the thus saith the Lord's that we were talking about in Sabbath school class. Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they that love thy law and... I heard it somewhere. Nothing shall offend them. We need to find that our differences are what draw us together. Differences can be strengths. She likes to have things nice, and he thinks the bedroom is neat if the dirty clothes are in just one corner. And he thinks those four posts on the bed are mannequins because at all times they're fully clothed. <laughs> she clanks her spoon on the cereal bowl, and the noise bothers him. She leaves her hairbrush on the bathroom counter. Character quirks. Every last one of us have them. The ones that we found, found the most charming, we later find that they are wedges if we're not careful. And if we will let them, those minor 
irritations can become irreconcilable differences. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, we need to look at that text perhaps in a little different light. Jesus did not ask us to be peacekeepers. Think about that. I mean, how many places in this world are we, are our forces, peacekeeping forces? And how many of those places have peace? Just, just think about that. Peacekeepers avoid conflict at any cost. Peacemakers take an honest look at differences and seek ways to come to a mutually acceptable resolution. And I, rem- I remember as a kid growing up, there was a couple. I can give you their names. It was Bill and Elsie May. And... Bob and Teresa back there know Bill and Elsie May. And one day, Elsie May put the oatmeal on the table in front of Bill. He pushed back his chair and said, Elsie May, we have had oatmeal every morning for breakfast for 20 plus years now. Do we have to have oatmeal for breakfast every morning? And Elsie May said, I thought that's what you wanted. I thought you liked oatmeal. I thought oatmeal was the only thing that was suitable for breakfast. He says, no, I don't like oatmeal. I've never liked it. I thought you liked it. And because nobody talked... They both endured oatmeal for 20 plus years. Here are six principles for peacemaking. Others might call them rules of warfare. State the obvious. I'm irritated or I'm concerned. You know, way back in the early days of our marriage, I was working with Joy. We were putting away the we were putting away the linens in the linen, linen closet. And I thought I was doing pretty good. First of all, I had them in the right cabinet. Big step. I had them folded. Step two. I had them on the right shelf. They were all together. And then she said, you know, those would look a lot better if all the folded edges were toward the front. And I said, I thought, you got to be kidding. I've got them in the right cabinet. I've got them folded. They're on the right shelf. They are together. What more does she want? And I took one of the wash rags and kind of... It was not my best move. (laughs) Okay? Um, I'll just say that. But the, the point of that is, if your partner goes to the effort to bring something up, it's worth taking it serious. Listen to them. Share your irritations with love and not character assassination, such as what kind of a sloppy person would leave his beard on the bathroom counter? Or never make your complaint a moral judgment. A really godly husband wouldn't get us lost like this at 11.30 at night and refuse to ask for help. Never insist that your solution is the only way Sometimes there may be a very simple compromise that maybe the simplest solution is to buy a tube of Crest for him and a tube of Colgate for her. Keep your complaint to just one issue at a time. So now having said that and lined up the the means of warfare, what we don't want to happen here today 
is for everyone to rush home from church and nail their 95 theses to the refrigerator door. <laughs> Following these guidelines, perhaps you can keep a minor dogfight from escalating to World War III. Sometimes your spouse is not going to change. And there's a story. It's not really true. Okay. Okay. But Let's... it makes a good point. There was a ship that was coming towards land and saw a light ahead. And the ship radioed ahead and he said, divert your course 0.5 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. And the reply was, I recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. And the ship captain came back and he said, this is a US Navy ship. Again, I say, divert your course. And the reply was, no, I say again, you divert your course. And the US ship said, this is an aircraft carrier, USS Coral Sea. We are a large warship of the US Navy, divert your course. And the answer came back, I am the lighthouse. It's your call. You know, there was a song in the 60s or 70s titled, Love Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. You see, as long as I'm in this world, I will from time to time say something to joy without thinking it through. In a moment of rashness, I may say something I regret. Ephesians 4.26 makes two statements. It says, be angry and sin not, and it says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed angry. Be very quick to say, I'm sorry, and be very quick to forgive. I believe one of those responses on the questionnaire was, be quick to forgive even if they haven't asked for forgiveness. And you know, sometimes we just need to put things in perspective. A while back, some of you may remember newspaper, that does do some dating right there, column, and I forget whether they were actually sisters who wrote the columns. There was Ann Landers and there was Dear Abby. And I forget which one of them it was. I'll say Dear Abby. And someone had written in and said, Dear Abby, my husband, this is paraphrasing, is a slob. He leaves his dirty clothes, particularly his socks, everywhere, and I'm having to pick them up all the time. How do I handle this? What suggestions would you give me? I don't remember what the answer was, because I don't know that I ever saw the original letter. But someone else wrote back in in response and said, I've been a widow for five years. There's not a day that I don't wish I could pick up his socks. Amen. Keep it in perspective. Amen. So we will add reconcile, reconciliation and forgiveness. Make God first in the marriage. One person put it this way, married to Christ first and foremost. And that takes us to... Except, this is Psalms 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Could we say, unless the Lord keep the fort, the watchman waketh but in vain? So we will add, God must be the center of our marriages. What we have presented today are principles to help hold and maintain the fort. Some may say, some may feel as they look back that they see nothing but wasted fields. 
But we we serve a God who is in the who is the master of restoration. Do you feel that the locusts have laid waste your fields in the past? If so, God has given a promise to those who are willing to turn their marriage or relationships over to him. Joel 2, 25 and 26 says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar. If you were farmers, you would know what all of that means, okay? And the palmer worm. My great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. We must remember, God can and will, is willing to restore. On the questionnaire over, to, over again, the response was pray together, pray often, pray for each other. I love the prayer of David in Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. It just seems appropriate to ask God each day for a clean heart and a right spirit. Did you know there is a special prayer promise for couples? Did you know that? Actually, it's for more than couples. But if you read Matthew 18, verse 19, it says, Again, I say unto you that if two of you agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So we will add the privilege of prayer. What a promise. It makes us wonder why we pray so little. Let us each vow to take full advantage of our special prayer privileges as couples and families. And we're going to present a song at this time, and I, I need to explain. Again, the song's a little dated. If you listen to it, it talks about the TV turning to snow. There was a time, and I remember those times, when some lesser radio stations and TV stations signed off at midnight. And when they did, the TV went to just white and black specks going back and forth continuously. The t TV turned to snow. Today we would say we got the big blue screen, okay? But at that point, uh, that is, is what, when it comes to the song, you will understand it. There we go. There's frost on the window, the TV's turned to snow. We should have been in bed many hours ago. But the day has slipped right by us, and it's sobering to find. Once again we've made the Lord the last thing on our mind but there's still time for a circle of two a circle of two you and i must rediscover why we're given to each other in a circle of two a circle of two Jesus promised he'll be there anytime anywhere he finds a circle of two now there's time for the work and Time for the play, but we never seem to find enough time to pray. So let's put the past behind us, 
we can start again tonight. Sit by me, hold my hand, we can make it right. Because he delights in a circle of two, a circle of two. You and I must rediscover why we're given to each other. In a circle of two, a circle of two, Jesus promised he'll be there anytime, anywhere. He finds a circle of two. Oh, he's waited and waited for us today. We can't make him wait any longer. Let's go to him now, you and I, cause he can make our love grow stronger. In a circle of two, a circle of two, you and I must rediscover why we're given to each other. In a circle of two, a circle of two, Jesus promised he'll be there anytime, anywhere he finds. A circle of two. Please stand and join us. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. Our Heavenly Father, you gave us families. You gave them to us back in the Garden of Eden. You meant for them to be a great blessing to us. We pray that you would send your spirit to each one of us in our homes and in our lives, that through your grace and your spirit, you would bind us together. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.